You, me, and HIFMB. Stories of science and the sea. Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of the HIFMB podcast. In this one, we are back with good audio quality uh, in the intro as well. So the entire episode is good quality again. So in this episode, I talked to Lukas Meisig, who is a community ecologist, a postdoc, who works on, um, used to work in, on seagrass in his uh, PhD. He now works on uh, benthic ecology of the Wadden Sea and into the role that seagrass can play in clearing polluted water. And that project is in collaboration with Tanzania and South Africa. And we look into his most recent scientific publication and his entire career in science. So without further ado, I give you Lukas Meisig. Okay, hey everybody and welcome to the next episode of the HIFMB podcast. And today I have Lukas Meisig, um, a postdoc at HIFMB. Welcome. Hello, thanks Jan. Yeah, no worries. What do you do at HIFMB? Um, well, yeah, as you said, I'm a, I'm a postdoc. Yeah. Uh, I started uh, one and a half years ago mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm focusing on climate change um, um, effects on benthic communities. Mm -hmm mostly in, in the water sea now. So we did a few uh, mesocosm experiments on, on heat waves and how benthic, uh, benthic ecosystems um, respond to heat waves. Um. Yeah, just so everybody knows, because uh, there's people listening who, who are not scientists. Hopefully. Ah, okay. um, so benthic is anything on the seafloor. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's correct. So all the, all the soft sediment worms and um, um, bivalves, um, how they are affected from, from, from heat stress then, um, due to heat waves especially summer heat waves and how this will also affect basically their, their functioning in the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, for example, like how they um, mix the sediment, yeah. um, how they filtrate um, um, particles out of the water column and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's currently the main focus, but yeah. yeah. And where do you do those mesocosm experiments, right? Uh, so is it in the, in the Warden Sea or? Yeah, it's in, in Sylt actually, um, mm -hmm. Avi Sylt. So yeah. Um, One of the one of the major uh, German islands. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's the yeah. And and that's what you've been doing all summer, right? Pretty yes. Much, yeah. Yes. And then there's a few experiments we also are currently doing. We did last year in in Finland still, where I did my PhD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, we're gonna get into that. So similar topic, um, also like responses to to heat stress. Yeah. Of um, um benthic organisms, but. But like um, in a different system in the Baltic Sea. Yeah. Then, yeah. But is it a coincidence that because so you also work on seagrass, which we're going to get into in a second, um, mm -hmm. and that Zylt has one of the largest seagrass beds in in the Warden Sea, right? Or I well um, does it? I don't uh, know. Uh, I, I think it might. It, it sounds it sounds correct. Yeah. Um, at least I know they have uh, huge problems in um, in the Netherlands with with their seagrass meadows, and right. they um, like scientists from the Netherlands quite often come to actually silt to collect um, um, seeds mm -hmm. and seedlings um, for, for restoration projects. That's mm -hmm. what I've heard. But, but that's not why you're doing your... No, no, no. This was just coincidence. Right, so okay. I, haven't, I haven't really been working with seagrass um, since I got my, my postdoc position here at HIFMB. Yeah, right. So that was kind of my expertise back then and, uh, mm -hmm. um, during my PhD mm -hmm. studies. Yeah. But you would consider yourself a, a seagrass expert? expert or maybe i don't know maybe <laughs> more like a i don't know i i, I like seagrasses I'm, yeah. <laughs> i'm probably not there to call myself uh an expert yet yeah let's let's hope maybe in a few years but okay yeah but you also recently started a um a, a new project that involves seagrass right in, yeah to an extent so this was this was also more coincidence um mm -hmm. <laughs> so actually just like um, Ruth from from the administration here at HFMB asked me if I want to be um, involved in this project yeah. um, in in Africa, mm -hmm. um, in both in Tanzania and in South Africa um, on on um, watershed pollution and how seagrasses can can help to reduce um, pollution in, in coastal areas. Mm -hmm. um, so can yeah. So, so that's uh, well, that's that's what we try to to find out. But right, I but, mean, but 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 where does the hypothesis come from? That they do um well first of all they they take up a lot of nutrients right um so they um reduce nutrients that like watershed um nutrient input um at the same time they they stabilize sediment they filter particles out of the sediment mm -hmm. um so they like um have um 
quite a, quite a big effect on on water clarification in general. Yeah, right. Like okay. also like the light penetration through the water, um, which then in turn can also benefit, for example, like adjacent um, um, ecosystems like coral reefs or mm -hmm. um, sponge gardens, whatever you have there. Um, so the hypothesis is that that um, with help of or by with, with seagrasses we can kind of um, um, promote also other ecosystems that are nearby and that might be threatened due to um, pollution. Um, pollution. Yeah. 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 Right. Sweet. And the, so, so how you got involved is is not because of your uh, seagrass expertise, but well, actually. A bit like I think there's no not so many people here at HFB who work with seagrass and yeah, who just know. said like well we had this idea to do something with seagrass with our collaborators from from um, South Africa and Tanzania and um, yes. would you like to be involved in it said, yeah of course yeah that great sounds, that sounds cool and and what's the so what's the project called first of all uh, it's called um, somewhat so <laughs> um, now let me let me think it's nature based solutions for watershed pollution mm -hmm. so. Um, so the whole it, it's um, funded by by the GI set. Um, they have this like Mervison initiative that funds um, collaborations between African and German um, and partner institutes. Yeah, what does GIZ stand for again? Uh, this is Gesellschaft für internationale Zusammenarbeit. Ah, okay, right. Yeah. Uh, 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 Society for International Collaboration. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct. It. I, I would guess so. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that this is their direct translation. Yeah, um, and so they. This is now the third call, and they fund fund projects um, that um, uh, this uh, this call was based on or was um, looking on nature based solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, how ecosystems can facilitate also um, like coastal coastal areas, um, yeah. and how with the help of ecosystems we can um, reduce some, for example, like um, watershed pollution or some yeah. some other. Um, issues uh, that are induced by by humans so. yeah i'm i'm always a bit s shaky on the on the nature-based solutions definition is is that what it means pretty much uh, like you just said that's yeah i, I don't know i hope so yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's at <laughs> least how I, how, how i think about it yeah exactly like yeah, um, perfect. using using like part of nature to actually tackle um some anthropogenic stressors mm -hmm. i would guess yeah so and some issues that come up to bite us in the end again yeah, yeah yeah okay and part of the project is also the restoration of of seagrass so whether so first you would see whether it actually solves or or immediate pollution uh, pollution <laughs> and then you would try to um, plant some no not re not really i think okay. that's more like an like an outlook um depending on mm -hmm. on what kind of um um response we get but the idea is to well first of all see how seagrass can tackle these issues um mm -hmm. uh, and then um based on this um start um together with, with local stakeholders with um with um, regional councils also to start um coming up with some with some um water quality guidelines mm -hmm. and monitoring tools that people can use there to um actually look at the the water quality and see, um yeah. like as an as an indicator like seagrass as an indicator yeah, and as right. a monitoring tool mm -hmm. for um water quality in in the area yeah okay um because especially in so we have we have been to to Zanzibar now and especially um where we are planning to work and uh, in the last 10 10 15 years a lot of hotels have popped up on the on the east coast especially mm -hmm. um and um all the all the wastewater is not really treated. Um, um, they just have septic tanks, and it basically runs directly um, into the into the ocean. Oh, right. And there's a lot of um, um, algal farmers yeah. um, that actually like live from algal farming right there, and they have a lot of lot of issues nowadays with um, like rashes, um, but also the there's like um, cyanobacteria overgrown on the algae. Oh, okay. um, then we work together with an NGO um, um, that. Um, uh, has sp sponge farms there mm -hmm. and also those have um, a lot of issues um, since the last years and they suspect it's it's the water quality I see, okay. um, in the lagoon so yeah the first idea would be to actually check if that's that's true if if, if the water quality has decreased there um, and then to see um, what benefits do seagrass meadows bring mm. and if we can actually make use of them um, and then 
all this 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 restoration project would be like an outlook maybe if you if we could somehow prolong the exper- uh, the, the the project mm-hmm. maybe this could be done in in the future but that's not at least not part of the current current project right. so far but th- that kind of like sounded um that it's not really known whether it's the pollution actually causing the issues but would you would you um investigate this as well or yeah so we want to we want to do some some surveys there um right. on, on water quality in general okay um, and then have a few comparable sites um, to s- to actually identify what what is the what is the huge issue is going on there, mm-hmm. um, how much have those new hotels polluted the the whole lagoon? Yeah. Um, what are the consequences for like local fishermen, for local algal farmers, um, for the sponge farmers? Um, and yeah, and then to see how we can tackle this maybe with help of seagrass. And how would you how would you do that? How would you involve the seagrass in the well? First of all, I, w- I would like to use seagrass as a as a simple monitoring tool because yeah. um, um, so we had this like w- when we went to to Sanz- uh, Tanzania and had um, this kickoff meeting, mm-hmm. we actually everybody had to um, start um, thinking about their project and come up with like a few like um, phrases, um, short um, mm-hmm. short summaries and of their project. And ours was, um, if I recall correctly, like healthy seagrass, healthy people. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so the idea would be to actually see how is the um, current status of the seagrass meadows, um, mm-hmm. and is does this relate to water quality? I see. Yeah. And if then we can, by simple monitoring tools um, from from local people, maybe um, kind of have um, have this this indicator um, if water quality turns 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 worse. Um, mm-hmm. Then we have to, for example, like um, come up with some guidelines. Um, have to come up with some restrictions for hotels, maybe when it comes to their um, um, sewage water. I see. Okay. So, so this kind of yeah kind of um, idea. And um, you mentioned some stakeholders that are involved. Are they? Which ones are they? Um, so far, we work together with this with this NGO with mm-hmm. the. Um, um, Coral farm, uh, sponge farmers. Sorry. Yeah. So it's actually um, uh, a Swiss NGO, but they're based there, um, and they um, have um, um, sponge nurseries um, in the deeper sea. Um. What's the Swiss, en- the Swiss NGO <laughs> called? Uh, it's called Marine Cultures. Okay. And so they have they have um, sponge um, nurseries in the deeper water, yep. and then work together with um, um, with uh, local women from the from from the area, mm-hmm. which then basically grow those sponges um, in the shallow waters um, and sell them um, then to, for tourists, um, but also sell them back to the NGO. For, right. okay. um, so the NGO makes no profit. Um, they just basically buy all the, all the sponges from them so they have like a stable income. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, they are really keen, of course, um, on, on finding out what, what the yeah. issues, the late issues um, have been on their, on their mm-hmm. sponges and why they have been... Or why they haven't grown that that well? Okay. So um, hopefully we might also collaborate with with Wyomza together. Mm-hmm. Um, which is the yeah yeah the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Organization. Yes. Um, so I mean they have been quite involved with Mervisn in general. So um, mm-hmm. this would be a potential project partner. And then in in South Africa also a lot of with those um, local councils and national parks there. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the South African team, they already have quite some tight collaborations with them. Right. Um, okay. So, and yeah, I think it's, it's going to be like maybe in, in Tanzania and South Africa, each like three or four stakeholders, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but we're still just in the co-design um, phase of the of the project. So the, the, the project hasn't even started yet. It's right. going to start in February. Mm-hmm. So we're still kind of um, have to decide with whom we work together. Um, okay. Yeah. Very early, early yeah, yeah, yeah. So, which this is a quite nice thing of this this whole project. So, um, they actually, um, you first of all, you have to you have to like submit like a um, preliminary proposal, basically, mm-hmm. um, and this is then if it's accepted, then you have this half a year or nine months even time for the co-design um, phase where you where okay. all the project partners and the stakeholders get together and actually come up with like a common agenda. Yeah, design um, it together. Yeah. yeah, and then then. Um, you start um, to actually work on the project. So, okay. so we're still in an early, early and, stage. And and your role uh, isn't really set yet in in stone, or or your specific uh, um, job, basically. No, not no. not really. I think it's just um, so. 
I always struggle a bit with the with the whole um, um, structure with um, HIFMB, University of Oldenburg. So yeah. um, Peter Schupp from University of Oldenburg mm -hmm. is involved. He's also, of course, from the HIFMB. So yeah. right. I'm not really sure like how to how to describe this the best. Um, yeah. And then then Sven Rode um, okay. from H um, um, ICBM. Mm -hmm. So um, and I'm basically I think the one of the main project partners from from yeah. HIFMB. Sweet. Um, yeah cool project coming up yeah it's going to be exciting okay looking forward to that yeah definitely then okay let's let's look into your cv for a bit um so you you yeah you're german Tim. yes yeah first of all you you grow up quite quite near from me i think uh, uh i'm from leipzig oh ah, okay cool yeah yeah that's uh, i'm from, from chemnitz which is like <laughs> yeah yeah super close 45 minutes or so drive yeah. yeah in the east of germany um did you And, and you did your master's in, in Freiburg. Uh, uh, sorry, your bachelor's. So your scientific career started in Freiburg? Yeah. yeah. In, so in the south of Germany. Um, because I, I think my, my grades weren't good enough to actually get into biology. Oh, I So really? then I had to take a little detour with like environmental science, which <laughs> okay. was without any like, what is it, NC numerus clausus. Uh, yeah, so, without entry requirements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, could just, you could just sign up and then you were in there. So it, Yeah. What, what drew you to, to Freiburg? To well, the south, I mean the Black Forest. The, well, I'm not. I'm not really like a forest person, but are you uh, not? Okay, <laughs> but the climate maybe. Yeah. Um, so and like a student city, it, it sounded really like like a, a good place to actually do your studies. And was it? It was awesome. Yeah, I really liked it. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Nice and, um, and quite far from family for the first time, which is also nice. Maybe to be a bit more independent. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. And you, you, while you were there, you also did like an, uh, a studies abroad trip where you then actually did biology, right? In, in um, Bilbao in Spain? A yeah, surprise. but this, I mean, yeah, I, I took a few courses, but everything was in, 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 in Spanish. So you yeah. know, it was just... Oh, the entire course was in Spanish? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, right. I'm not even sure if I passed a single one there. Because, <laughs> <laughs> right. because of language issues. Do you speak Spanish a little or...? Back then, a bit, but then I, I haven't used it anymore since. Oh, okay. Ever, ever since, so. Yeah. Where do you think it is, your, your, your Spanish? Like, really, really basic. I yeah, think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not sure if I would pass an A1. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and the, okay, and then you, you, from there, you moved to, uh, to, to Oldenburg, actually, yeah. for, for a master's. Yeah, that's correct. And for, so environmental mod uh, modeling, that was... So statistics was always on the forefront of your Well, mind, I, mean, I actually started with uh, marine environmental sciences, mm -hmm. um, but then switched to environmental modeling because I think all the modules were, you could just, um, you could just take models from you know, both, both um, courses. Okay. Um, and then I think the idea was to, or I just realized I could, I could graduate a bit earlier um, if I take environmental modeling because mm -hmm. um, there was one, I don't know, there was one course that I would have to add for marine environmental science so um i think it was just a bit more practical to actually finish with environmental modeling yeah okay um but i think the the courses were the same more or less so yeah. i think you're quite free to choose whatever you want here um, okay. at the university which is quite nice so that's your first experience with with oldenburg done and then is that what did you like it here did you live here or Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I lived here first in Oldenburg for one and a half years and then I moved to Bremen. Yeah, right. Um, just for like a bit big city vibes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yes. Um, but I, I really enjoy Oldenburg still. Like yeah. it's, a, it's a nice place. Nice. That's what drew you back to the city. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and the, so for your, for your thesis, you also worked on um, alternate stable states. So uh, that's something I worked as well, uh, worked on as well during my PhD. Um, did you work on feedbacks as well, so on ecological feedbacks? Uh, no, not really. Um, we did this bit more like in a, or we tried to work a bit on feedbacks um, mm -hmm. later on um, during my PhD um, experimentally, but yeah, uh, this, you know, this this never really works like you you yeah, exactly. expect it to work. Yeah. So, um, but back in New Zealand, this was um, like a like they had like this this disturbance recovery model. Oh, hold on, on in, in New Zealand, so that's. Um So from during your your masters in Oldenburg, you then did a. Semester. I did my master thesis in New Zealand. That was the the basically my master thesis project was the alternate stable states. Ah, okay, uh, yeah, yeah. And that was uh, f for how long were you there? In uh, for six or seven months. Oh, I right. Think. Yeah. Your your supervisor here was Jan Freund. Yeah, and and then uh, in New Zealand was Carolyn Lundquist from from Niva. 
Okay. Um, it's the National Institute for Water and Atmospheric Research, I All think. Right. <laughs> um, so like a semi-commercial -com um, institute. So they both do like um, research, but also co commercial contracting. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a bit odd how it works there. All right. But yeah, and there I, I worked on, on like some, some disturbance yeah. um, model of benthic um, ecosystems. Yeah. Um, yeah. First time in New Zealand. How was that? It's it's amazing. Like to. Yeah. But unfortunately, I didn't have much time to actually um, to actually get get out of the out of the office so much. Oh, I see. So and also in New Zealand, you can't do much without a car either because yeah, they don't have yeah. like public public transport. Yeah. So I didn't see much actually. I just like visited a few cities, but I haven't really seen much of nature there. Well, where is uh, Neva? Is that an? It's in Hamilton. Hamilton. No. Okay. So that's like I guess like to. I don't know. It's it's, it's not, not really like a, a pretty city. It's the middle of, uh, in between um, Auckland and Wellington, it's like half halfway okay. there. Um, right. I've never been to New Zealand. Is that North or South Island? Uh, North Island. North I have Island, actually okay. never seen the South Island, ah, okay. which is like a lot of people like just laugh about me when when you go to like for six months <laughs> in New Zealand, you haven't seen the South Island. It's probably not a good thing, I guess. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, y y you were busy with work. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. And then PhD started. Um, in, in, in the same year when you finished your your mm -hmm. uh, your masters and for that you went to Finland yes yeah yeah how, how did you get that position uh, this was actually because of my time in New Zealand they have quite from the the researcher from from Neva they have quite some close ties to um, um, Finnish researchers ah, okay um, and since I didn't want to go so far away for a PhD um, my supervisor then Carolyn she suggested to go to to um, Finland if you yeah. want to do something and yeah does she have ties with uh, uh, Scandinavia she sounds Scandinavian uh, like yeah this? but this is uh, like unrelated I think right okay so okay. this is like like third generation back oh I see something like she's American so there's a lot of you yeah. know right okay um, and so so they suggested you for the f or, or they they highlighted the position to you and then you had to apply. yeah she she showed me like a few positions there um, mm. of of um, um, friends she has worked with before and so see, okay. and said this this could be like a good good place to go yeah like this would be maybe something that would suit you and yeah nice of, yeah and that's the first time that you work with seagrass then yeah yeah actually i, I applied for the position didn't even know what seagrass is so yeah it was a bit <laughs> <laughs> perfect yeah and uh, were you based yeah where were you based what's the uni called the uni is called obo academy Obo, um, okay so it's a, a Swedish-speaking university in, in Finland. They have a Swedish-speaking minority in Finland. Oh, okay. So 5% of the population speaks Swedish, actually. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, along the coastline, mostly. Yeah. And this is in the university is in, in Turku, or Obo in, in Swedish. Ah, okay. Ah, um, right. So that's why it's called Obo Academy. Yeah, okay. Now it all makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so you weren't based in Helsinki? No, no. no. Okay. In, But uh, it's just like two hours drive, so it's... Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was wondering why why in your CV it doesn't actually say that you speak Finnish but Swedish. Yeah. So, so it's because of that. Yeah. 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 So I took a Swedish course instead of um, a Finnish course because all my colleagues were Swedish speaking, and then in in Turku also like the I think the, the there's like at least like ten percent who speak Swedish instead of like yeah. everywhere else. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> it's like considered like the Swedish capital of, of of Finland because actually when I think when Finland still belonged to Sweden it was the actual capital of of, of Finland. Ah. Okay. So. Ah, now it all makes sense. So and your your uh, supervisor was Christopher Bostrom. Yeah. Who so. is Swedish, presumably? No, he's he's Finnish he but Finnish. Swedish speaking. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, that's. Oh, yeah, that, that's a difference. Yeah, okay. And um, yeah, sorry. No, no, continue. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so so you th then you actually work with feedbacks in in uh in seagrass communities. Yeah, yeah, a tiny bit. Yeah. Um at least we I mean that there's I mean seagrass seagrass as ecosystem engineers, um mm -hmm. they depend a lot on on feedbacks, right? So yeah, um yeah. they the more denser the, the seagrass meadows are, the more they can actually I don't know, um um um, filter filter the water column from particles or so and yeah. the more the more light they actually get so they have like positive feedbacks with their own density mm -hmm. the more seagrass is there the more stable it actually is yeah so, um, so maybe maybe it's worth getting into what an ecosystem engineer is oh yeah well yeah. that's that's true yeah so well i would consider an ecosystem engineer like any any organism that actually directly or indirectly um sort of affects their environment yeah exactly um and 
also affects other other organisms around them. Mm -hmm. So um, I I guess seagrasses are quite classical examples for ecosystem engineers because they uh, have a huge effect on on hydrodynamics. Um, they reduce currents and waves, um, so they provide a lot of shelter for for associated um, mm -hmm. um, organisms there. Yeah. Um, they can stabilize the sediment, reduce erosion through their roots. Um, so they have quite a strong effect on, on their surroundings. Okay. Um, I think like the, the cl most classical example from the terrestrial world is probably like a beaver who builds a dam. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I yes. guess that's what they like the exactly. Yeah. Who, who textbook hasn't. textbook example of an ecosystem engineer. I yeah. Guess. Exactly. An extraordinary uh, impact on its on its ecosystem that yeah, it lives yeah. in. Yeah. Exactly. Sweet. The 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 feedbacks actually I I, I work with were macroalgal based on coral reefs and they have the exact same like when they get denser and denser fish for some reason feed less on them and then the herbivory or, or the the um the, the plant eating pressure is lessened and lessened and then okay. they get even denser and denser so it's also density it's okay yeah yeah but in this case you actually Wait. want seagrass in on coral reefs you don't want yeah algae. yeah yeah that's yeah. but yeah very very interesting parallels <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a lot of parallels between all those, you know, yeah. uh, habitat forming yeah. um, um, species. And is Toko so. by the by, by by the sea or Obo? Yeah, it's uh, it's directly by the sea, by the um, Baltic Sea. Yeah, yeah, and that's where so, your field work also. No, works. but um, so um, there's like this this huge um, archipelago with like I don't know like forty five fifty thousand islands, yeah, okay. um, which is like right in front of Toko and in, in the Baltic Sea, and um, and one of those islands we had our. Um, field station mm -hmm. nice. so which is quite a beautiful place to be actually yeah it's really cool did you spend a lot of time there all my summers i think there. yeah nice. it's quite isolated so you know you're, you're basically alone for most of the summer yeah um but it's really beautiful mm -hmm. it's really nice yeah gr it's, and uh, like one of your i think uh f <laughs> we also our timelines for for like phd and all that line up very very nicely like uh in in 2019 i thought Uh, you had your first first author paper. Is it the same in Finland or or in the Swedish system? I don't know, like Finnish and Swedish system, um, that you write your um, thesis in chapters, and yeah. each chapter is a publication or can be a publication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the same. Is it? It, it isn't the same in Germany. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't. You do can it. have those, those monographs, right? Where you're just exactly. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it, it depends on you. I think. And yeah, but I think this came in a bit more handy yeah, yeah yeah absolutely yeah at yeah. least if you want to stay in science i guess and then yeah. you, you need your publications anyway right yeah exactly so, yes so and f in in 2019 your your publishing career yeah. kicked off yeah <laughs> so wh where have you been for your in PhD? in lancaster in the um northwest of england like ah, okay an hour north of of liverpool so it's the same there then with it publishing is, yeah. chapters yeah 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 okay or well you can do monographs i, I think too but um it's it's my supervisor advised me not to do it yeah 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 exactly so yeah um and then uh let's talk about one of your recent publications which actually is on um seagrass mm -hmm. and it is let me find it sorry <laughs> <laughs> so it is uh on on uh, seagrasses as coastal um ecosystem engineers and how they affect sediments right mm -hmm. yeah that's correct but an in interaction with bivalves yeah muscles. yeah yeah so um, actually during, during my PhD, my, my supervisor and his, his group, they worked on this um, project, um, MASSES, which is one of those Horizon 2020 projects um, on ecosystem restoration. Mm -hmm. um, so restoration of coastal habitats um, um, and he focusing on, on seagrass. And there was quite some research that, um, done already on how bivalves could potentially facilitate seagrass. Yeah. So we wanted to explore this a bit more, how like the bivalves in the Baltic Sea um, in this area can actually benefit maybe seagrass as well. So I was focusing yeah. a bit on this seagrass bivalve interactions. How, how do they do it? Like how do um, bivalves facilitate seagrass well i mean there's there's different mechanisms of course right. really context dependent depending yeah. on the environment depending on on where you are um yeah. but of course they can through their um, um deposits like biodeposition um they just fertilize the, the sediment mm -hmm. this is one um one way they can can facilitate seagrass I see, okay. um they can of course filter a lot of, lot of particles out of the water column yeah um, so they actually increase like light penetration um, ah, yeah, and for seagrass, seagrass which is also yeah, 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 makes it um, better for them. 
I think there's also like other other studies showing that they actually can protect them from 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 storms as well because they anchor them a bit, especially like those I don't know like blue mussels um, that are can form quite dense like and stable like patches yeah, in right. seagrass meadows. So okay, and then this this usually works like vice versa. So it's it's considered a mutualism depending on where you are, of course. And mm -hmm. there's also negative effects between those, but um, we at least thought that um, seagrass can also benefit bivalves there in the area mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to um, look into this a bit more um, closely and I was focusing a bit then on, on hydrodynamics and how they both affect yeah um, exactly I wanted to get into that are you, do you did you have experience before that with oceanography and no not really but okay. um, we had um, or had like with I don't know my like third like um, supervisor unofficial supervisor yeah. he was from uh, he was working in, in um, Gothenburg um, or Christineberg the, the field station of University of Gothenburg mm -hmm. on hydrodynamics and um, so for one chapter I just went there to do some work um, at, at his station and he has all those um, cool um, wave flumes and uh, current uh, flumes so you can you can play play around a lot with those um, with those um, tanks yeah um, simulating different waves and currents, and see how the the animals and the and the plants react to this. Um, so and then I got got a bit into this. Yeah. So maybe for visualization, does it look like a wind canal a little bit, like but in in the water? Yeah, yeah, a bit maybe, like in, yeah. in, in, maybe a bit smaller. I don't know. Like, yeah, a um, bit smaller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah, it's like a how how can you describe it? Like a like a huge like like a huge basin where you have like a you have a paddle at the end and it just moves moves the water around mm -hmm. um and creates waves. Yeah. Um and then and you this, see how they move with, with like dye with color or no? No, but we have to you, you can measure them of course. Like oh, with, yeah, okay. with you have those ADVs uh, acoustic Doppler velocimeter or oh, God, okay, it's like yeah. fancy fancy tools that yeah. can actually um yeah. Um can measure um, the the wave intensity, um, the the speed, mm -hmm. um, so the orbital velocity of the waves, and so on. All right. Um, and then, yeah, we were we were interested in how seagrass can affect both like the wave um, the wave velocity, but also um, the effect of waves on sediment and sediment transport. Mm -hmm. And the so back to your publication, the um, you investigated the the interaction between. Two species, the, yeah, the, no, multiple species, right? Yeah, so. multiple, multiple species. So, um, but always like seagrass in combination with with um, one one bivalve species. So. But it was one species of seagrass. Yeah, yeah. So there's basically there is just one species of seagrass, like in the like in the Baltic Sea. I see. Okay. Um, and I think they like in the Warren Sea they have two, um, which look quite similar, just yeah. different in size. Okay. So there's not so much diversity up here in the north. Like they get more diverse in the, in the tropics, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but you don't have so many species here. Yeah. Do you know um, the English name? Uh, eelgrass. Eelgrass, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so, um, normally, like um, f for for background purposes, um, normally I think in such interaction studies are quite rare because interactions are always really tricky statistically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So most studies actually do single effects. Yeah, yeah. That's but yeah, that's that's what really sets your study apart because it's one of these interaction studies. Was it in situ? Like, did you do your work in in the field or was it a lab study? It was a lab study. A lab study, yeah, okay. Yeah, so and we worked with two labs, like one of them was the one in Sweden with those um, with their wave tank. Okay. And then we also decided to get um, some some little wave tanks in Finland. Yeah, right. So and then somebody had to test them and do like uh, some first project with them. So that was me then. Ah, okay. Um, so we combined those two studies to one because they work on a quite similar topic on, on erosion of sediment in basically different coastal um, ecosystems. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, and both in the Baltic Sea, also in the um, this was the Swedish West Coast, the other part. Yeah. Um, you have quite often like a lot of bivalves um, intermixed with seagrass meadows, so you can get like you know you can get cockles and like uh, uh, high abundances in seagrass meadows, um, um, clams, blue mussels, um, yeah. and then Swedish West Coast sometimes also like oysters nowadays. Mm -hmm. So, right, nice. And but but it's not really clear how oysters interact with uh, seagrass or eelgrass. Not 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 really because I think they. I mean the the Pacific oyster they have there now um, yeah. has been introduced like was in the sixties or so for for aquaculture reasons. Okay, all right. Um, and they 
they don't really intermix so much with seagrass. Um, if they get too dense, I think the seagrass is not so happy. But um, you have quite often you have like those those single oysters or like small patches in the meadows. Mm -hmm. um, but there hasn't been done so much um, on that okay. so far. I think. Okay. And At least not in the area. Yeah. So the study that uh, we're talking about that came out came out this year, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> But it, it took a while to get there. Like, <laughs> yeah, w w was it the the biggest paper or the biggest chapter of your PhD? Or? I, at least the one that I liked the most. I yeah, think. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because of that interaction, or why? Yeah, you... both. But also about the, I, I love this, those hydrodynamics. It's cool. It's yeah. like nice to you know <laughs> like work with those flumes um, and yes. wave wave tanks and um, yeah. I, I I I think I don't know. I just liked liked it. Yeah. Far the most. Yeah. I mean, well, you're always a bit like you know you you know. At least it was for me so that like for the first chapters i wasn't really like super happy about them and you're yeah. like yeah okay it's, no, exactly. it's okay but uh, well <laughs> exactly the same for me i've got two chapters that i'm not super happy about mm -hmm. and two that i am really proud of um but the so, so uh you, you said it took a while did it take long because of the publication or the the work or uh, mostly the, the publication process was quite long I yeah think, but okay yeah it's a good journal that it came out though limnology and oceanography yeah yeah it's cool i'm really happy about that yeah <laughs> <laughs> nice congrats thanks so, so let's talk about what you actually found yeah um so uh yeah maybe i i give the word to you <laughs> yeah thanks so yeah we had those two two different study sites so we did like the experiment in finland um mm -hmm. and there we looked on seagrass in combination with the baltic clum uh, which is like limicola baltica i think the yeah okay the um latin name um which is quite um abundant in seagrass meadows there okay and in sweden we looked on on cockles and oysters and seagrass together okay um and the idea was to see how they actually affect um, um sediment transport um, under different wave um, um, strengths and because it's known that, that seagrass at least can reduce sediment erosion um, there's also some studies on how um, um, bivalves can um, reduce sediment erosion if they are like epiphyllal bivalves yeah. um, so bivalves that actually sit on top of the sediment mm -hmm. um, then in faunal bivalves that, that live in the sediment okay. um, like clams and cockles for example they are usually um, suggested to have a bit more like a, um, a positive effect on erosion processes so they increase erosion because they they so move through the sediment yeah they destabilize the yeah, yeah yeah right okay so but and we wanted to do to, to look on those different um, kind of like um, functions mm -hmm. um, in combination mm -hmm. so um, so what we found was actually that um, Surprisingly, like this in in Finland and um, in the Baltic Sea, this this infernal um, clum, the Baltic clum, yeah. had um, a positive effect on on sediment stabilization, um, which was a bit against what what we thought in the beginning. We thought in, they, in they interaction was, with eelgrass, but also alone it was uh, okay. Yeah, right. and um, and we we assumed that it's because of the of the sediment, which was quite coarse, mm -hmm. um, and this sediment. Um, I guess like resuspension doesn't play such a such a big role. So um, the finer particles they are not there. Yeah. So they don't really resuspend particles into the water column. Okay. Um, but just through their pure like like physical um, structure in the sediment, they might just kind of um, reduce um, transport. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then this effect was of course the strongest when um, seagrass and um, those uh, um, clumps were um, combined yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there wasn't like anything like like a huge interaction between them, but it was just like a quite additive additive positive effect on sediment stabilization between the two. So so they do well together. They would yeah yeah okay. they would they both um, basically stabilize the sediment mm -hmm. alone and in combination. Um, cool. And we also found at least that there was a slight positive effect on on dislodgement of of um, seagrass shoots when the oh, okay. um, when the clumps were there. Yeah. So they actually anchored the clumps a bit at different, like cool. at, especially at higher um, wave velocities. So there's positive effects between them, and they yeah, yeah, they are not they are not really strong. Um, also, yeah. we didn't have maybe enough replicates to actually you know go yeah. through this a bit bit um more carefully um so but at least there's an indication um that mm. those clumps can can anchor um, yeah. seagrasses and maybe therefore also maybe some some uh, measure in when you want to do some restoration in yeah. like more exposed sites yeah exactly so. could they could they counteract erosion if there's like a, a huge or, or a huge field of of or a meadow i don't know what you call it uh, a meadow with mm -hmm. uh, clams and seagrass together could they maybe counteract 
erosion. Well, I mean, at, at least this is a bit what what the study indicates. But then yeah. it's still it's a it's a lab study, right? So it's yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. hard to extrapolate this to the field. Um, yeah. So where wave conditions might be completely different to what we have, we had quite like a you know yeah quite like a really clean simulated uh, simulated yeah. wave. Yeah. Um, so this is more like a like a mechanistic paper, maybe mm -hmm. to just look. First of all, on, on some some interactions and some mechanisms. Exactly. I mean, I mean, that's what you need at first. Um, what, and, and what did you find with the other two uh, clams? So um, with the oysters, we didn't find any effect. Okay. Um, which is surprising because I mean, all the papers say that like oyster, oysters reduce erosion, of course, but yeah. um, only if, when they are like in those big um, oyster oyster reefs. Yeah. Um, in since in the seagrass meadows they're just like um, individual oysters. Um, oh, okay. And we used those those densities. And we couldn't find a strong effect on sediment erosion, but do the, they? Sorry, can you remind me? Do they sit on the on the uh, sediment or in the sediment? It depends a bit on the on the sediment. I mean, they they, just, they sit on the sediment, right? Okay. Um, but if it's a bit muddier, they can also like like go into it. A they or they no, they don't go in, but they stay basically erect. Right. Um, so they they look out of the sediment. So they're a bit more like let's say a few centimeters in. Okay. But they have different positions actually depending on the sediment type. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so no effect with no effect oysters. with oysters, but we just had like we just looked on basically effects on of three oysters um, okay. in those um, in those tanks. Okay. Um, but um, the the cockle yeah like what, this, the third one yeah, yeah. Um, they had um, a really destabilizing effect on um, on sediment erosion. Oh okay. And I guess the most surprising result from the study was that um, so seagrass has a positive effect, the cockles have um, a negative effect, mm -hmm. but when you combine them, the this negative effect is completely vanished. Um, you just have the positive effect of seagrass on okay. on um, sediment stabilization. S so it completely so, overtakes. Yeah, there's no difference if you have seagrass alone or seagrass with cockles. Um, yeah. They just stabilize the sediment. Interesting. Whereas when you have just cockles, they destabilize the sediment. But but cockles, they don't do anything negative for seagrass so they don't do anything on the dislodgement part or um i mean there's not so many so many um studies on cockles and seagrass i think yeah okay so um i can't i can't recall if, if i have any, have seen any study on, on cockles and seagrass yeah, interactions okay. but i but mean in yours you didn't find it no no oh, okay. no um yeah wow that's some that's some interesting results so do you think that um maybe the the I guess the most positive outcome would be the one with uh, with the clam, the interaction. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and do you think that could actually work with with restoration projects as well, or work towards restoration? Well, the, the thing is, um, we also done a few other studies on on this Baltic clam with um, seagrass, and you know, once you have a positive effect, then ne next time you have a negative effect. Um, okay. It's I don't know if it's just like context dependent mm -hmm. or if it's just like really like a variable as well. Um, okay. You would just have a huge variation between the effects yeah, right. depending on maybe the density as well um, and the area where you where you put them. So. But you um, definitely laid the groundwork for for more studies to be done. Yeah, yeah. hopefully. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. So I, I think at least what we assumed is that in those more exposed sites, um, they can have. Uh, a benefit a benefit for seagrasses mm -hmm. whereas maybe in those more sheltered sites where you also have finer sediment um, higher nutrients already in the sediment and um, they might actually have a more negative or slightly negative effect on yeah. seagrass wow so i guess seagrass restoration is always tricky so it really depends on yeah um, um your um environmental conditions yeah um, exactly in situ so yeah Okay, cool. So we're already at the at the forty five minute mark almost. Cool. Um, is there anything you want to add that hasn't been highlighted or anything? Um, mm, no, but just I, no. I don't think so. No. Just want to say thanks to you. Yeah, no worries. Really cool, like really cool format. I like it. Yeah, cool. So, have you ever been um, interviewed? I have not yet. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe at, at at some point at like a millennium episode. No, yeah. no, I'm not that important. I don't know. <laughs> at like episode nineteen or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Then thank thanks you very a lot. much for coming. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. See you around. See bye you bye. around. Want to dive deeper? Surf over to hifmb.de or follow us on Twitter at hifmb underscore ol.